Um, typically on a weekend, you know when we're in here, you, you might take notes, but we don't always leave a lot of time for you to really process what you're thinking about, be reflective and get quiet, and that's okay. But this week is going to be a little different. We're going to give you plenty of time to do that. We're going to give you time to write your thoughts down, and we want you to write down what God is saying to you. So that's, that's where we're going, and we don't apologize for that. So I'm glad you guys are here. You're here on purpose, and you're in the right spot. So two weeks ago, Pastor Rick mentioned something in a story. Briefly, he mentioned uh, a particular kind of a tree, a redwood tree, a, a sequoia. And I want to take that a little bit further. This picture that you see on the screens is a picture of a tree called the President. It's in Yosemite National Park. This is 85 high-resolution photos stitched together, never been photographed all at one time before. And it's pretty incredible, so impressive. It's the, not only the largest living thing, but the fastest growing. And I think it's about 3,000 years old. And it's glorious. I'm showing you this because we want you to see the size and scope of it. Uh, these guys love trees more than I think I love anything. How it's much? on its way. Yeah, he says picking up already. I can see it. That, that is Spider-Man on the left, just so you, if you were curious. Uh, uh, this is in Yosemite National Park. This tree is over 3,000 years old. But about two years ago in the Redwood Forest, after a big snowstorm, one of these trees fell over. The tree has a name, and the reason why we're showing this to you is because I want you to see how large these things really are. The tree's name is Wawona, W-A-W-O-N-A. -A. It has a name because it's famous. Every president has had their picture taken in front of this tree. It's got a, a tunnel cut out of the base of it so people could actually walk through it. And that tree was 227 feet tall. It's pretty tall. It is 2,100 years old, and two years ago, it fell over. That's rare. Why is that a big deal? You know, in that classic joke, like, if a tree falls over in the woods, and this is not that. I'm not, it's not a setup for a dad joke. This is sincere. This tree fell over. Now, think about how old this tree is. Just for a second, think about this. If it's 2,100 years old, it was here before Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. It's been through every world war. It's been through every president of the United States. And that tree was 100 years old when Jesus walked this earth. It's pretty old. So when a tree like that falls over, we want to find out why. Is it global warming? What was it? So a bunch of scientists got together, or treeologists, that's not a word. They got together, and they just started doing some research on it. And this is what they determined was the cause of that tree's demise. It was foot traffic. Foot traffic is what killed that tree. It has its own parking lot. People drive in year-round to stand next to that tree and take a picture, take a selfie, take a video, have a family moment. And what they're doing is they're walking on the root structure, and they basically trampled that tree to death. That's why it fell over. Now, for you and I, foot traffic in our life is, is soccer games, paying your taxes, board meetings at work, doing the dishes, going to pick up kids from school and groceries, and all of that and if we don't have a deep and strong root structure in our life, we have the potential for all of that stuff to trample us to death because we're busy people. we got a lot of stuff going on. What we want to talk about today is how you can take your next step in your walk with God and develop that stronger root structure. And I want to identify with you guys here for a second because I think we are a lot alike, you and I. And I'm, just because I'm standing here on this stage doesn't mean that I'm any different than you or I'm better than you. I just happened to grab the microphone from somebody else who was going to talk. And <laughs> I beat him out. I'm kidding. I'm going to ask you guys two questions. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Now, I will warn you, I am not a hand raiser. I actually saw you, so I, I see you folding your hands, and I immediately know exactly what you feel. I'm never going to raise my hand. In fact, I never do, ever. And here's why I don't do it, because I think it's a trap. You're trying to trick me. You want to prove a point. You want me to look like an idiot, and I get it every single time. I'm not that guy. So if anybody is not going to trap you and try and bait you with a cookie and then make you do yard work after by raising your hand, I'm not doing that, all right? There's no tricks in this. But I'm asking you genuinely to raise your hand yes or no on these two, okay? So sincerely, have you ever been trained 
in how to have a quiet time or a devotional with God? Has anybody ever trained you in how to open up a Bible, how to read it and understand what it says, how to pray that scripture over your life? Has anybody ever trained you, walked you through it, point A to point B? Raise your hand. Okay? That's a pretty decent number. I'm proud of you guys. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Good for you. Keep your hand up as long as you want. That's all right. Okay, hands are down. We're going to reset this one. I got you too. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is not the end of service. I'm not doing that. I got that hand. I got that hand. We're, doing, we're done. All right, scratch that. Hands are down. Reset. Now, everybody else, I need you to vote on this one as well. How many of you guys, if you've been coming here for a while, or any church for that matter, and you come into church and you hear somebody from this stage implore you, encourage you, challenge you to dig into God's word, like get into God's word. You need more than what you're just going to get on Sunday. You need to dig into his word and find out what it says for you. You need to spend time praying. You need to connect with God. How many of you would say that we encourage you to do that? Let me see hands. Oh yeah, there we go. All right. That's almost everybody. I got you. Okay. You can put those hands down. I've asked this question in a couple of really big rooms full of people, a lot of guys, a lot of men in, in our, our men's ministry across the state, and it's very similar. The, the, the ratio is very similar. I actually stood in a room, and I asked a couple hundred guys that same question, and not one hand went up. And these are some of the strongest leaders I have ever been around in my life. And I realized something, that you and I are actually a lot alike in this. And I understand that you might be frustrated like me because even up until less than a year ago, I have sat on that front row there. I've sat in the second row here. I've sat in the back booth. I've done production. I've helped in kid life and little life. I have not made coffee, thank God. I've helped in the parking lot. I've helped in 412. I've helped in every corner of this church. But something has always frustrated me. And that's that we encourage people to dig into this. But I will hear somebody say, man, I really had a great, just a rich time in God's word today. I have never said that in my life. I mean, they'll literally go as far as to say, man, I had a rich, meaty word. It was just a rich, thick word. It was just strong. I was like, what are we talking about? Is this stew? Why are you saying it's rich? I, I, just, I don't understand it. And I also don't understand why I have not had those times because it feels like it's been a struggle for me. Maybe you feel like this. So what I've done for years is I've read through devotional plans, or I've gotten a book, or I will download the Bible app, and I will search a topic, and I'll find a devotional that seems like it stands out to me, and I'll just dive in for that. But I always feel like something is missing. Like every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get one. But it's like a, a blind squirrel. Every once in a while, we'll find a nut. Every once in a while. And that's the way I felt. And it frustrated me. And I'm a competitive guy. You might be competitive. But you might be sitting here just like I have for so long and you're saying, God, how is it that other people are having these incredible moments but I'm not? Like why is it difficult for me because it's frustrating? And this realization hit me. As I'm reading somebody's devotional, some devotional plan, I'm actually reading somebody else's quiet time. Like I might as well be cracking up. It's like I snuck into their room and pulled out their diary and did a find, replace all with their name and put my name in it, and I'm reading that. Now that I'm being sarcastic, but at the same time, I get like, God, why can't I open up the Bible and find out what they found out? Why can't I find that for me? And it made me frustrated for years, but I would still grind it out. Like I love God. I want more of him, but why is it so difficult and so hard? And this realization hit me. We don't need to stand up here and encourage you to do this anymore. We do this constantly. It's time for us to show you and not tell you. So what we're going to do today is very different from what we have typically done. We are actually going to go through and walk you through how to have a quiet time. What is a quiet time? That could be a devotional. Uh, it really just means an unhurried time with God. And I'm going to give you a chance to write things down. I'm going to give you um, some time where actually Brandon will play keys in a little bit. And that's already of God. I can promise you that. This is something we want to do together because I have been where you are. And listen to me. We challenged a couple hundred guys in, in our men's ministry to do this back in January. And they said the same thing that a lot of you said. Like, I've never really been trained on it, but I, I feel like you're telling me to do it. But I don't know where to start. I don't know where to open the Bible. And they did it. And I'm telling you, by about week four, it clicked. You ask any of them, and they're like, I know more about what God's will for my life is. 
I feel like I understand the Bible for the first time and I'm actually winning. Everybody look at me for a second. We're all trying to figure out how we win in life. Business, in our family, raising our kids, you know, dealing with all kinds of stuff, physical, health, all that stuff. You want to know, are you winning? And this is something that you can put into practice and we want you to develop this skill in your life. I just said something that might sound a little bit different than what you have heard in church before. Anybody pick up on what I just said? I'm going to develop a skill in your life. And your walk with God, your quiet time with God can be a skill. In fact, it is. You're like, I'm I'm going to need to check you on that one. I'll prove it to you. See, what we think is that somebody else naturally can do this and we can't. Like, they were just born that way. I know you're looking at me and you're like, he's a natural bodybuilder. He just has that. I get it. That's what people think. But when we look across the aisle and we compare ourselves to somebody else, that comparison is a trap, first of all. But you also say, well, why do they do it? And I can't. Listen, if somebody else is having incredible time in God's word, they weren't born that way. They didn't enter this world with a pen and a, uh, like a notebook in their hand like, Mother, Father, it is so good to see you. Please, I'm in a quiet time and journal right now. That's not, it does, no one's born that way. They just spent more time developing this skill. There's a scripture in Ecclesiastes 10.10, and Pastor Rick has talked about this scripture so many times, and I've glossed over it. I'm going to read through this, and I'm going to prove to you that this is a skill that you can become proficient in. Now, this scripture is talking about what happens if you have an axe head and it is dull. What happens? Ecclesiastes 10.10 says, if the axe is dull and its edge is unsharpened, more strength is needed. All that's saying is, if, if you are, I don't know if any lumberjacks in here, I don't know if, if you're swinging an axe at a tree and it's dull, you just have to swing harder. It takes more effort, more energy, you're sweating, but skill will bring success. What is skill in this scripture? Sharpening it. So if we will sharpen this area of our life and develop it, it is a skill that will bring success. This is scripture. Now listen, I want to say something really quick. I'm not talking about working on your, working on your salvation. I'm not saying that you need to work harder to get saved because you can't do that. Jesus did that and he's incredible at it. I'm talking about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Scripture says we need to work it out. We need to grow up. That's what this means. But so many of us don't know how to do it. The Bible says, that scripture, all scripture is God breathed. Second Timothy three, sixteen through seventeen. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we can be equipped for good works, and I want that scripture at work in my life, where do I start? We're gonna help you. We're gonna help you do that. And that is where this paper comes into play. Now, I know what it's like to feel like you're behind. Listen, I I just need to identify with you guys here for just a second. I know what it's like to feel like you're behind, like you're looking around the room and you're going, why are they able to do it and I'm not? And what we have the tendency to do is to say, wait, if everybody else is doing this and I'm not, I'm just behind. And no one's going to raise their hand and go, I don't get it. (laughs) No one's going to do that. So you stay there longer and all it does is feed into the fact that you were behind and you think you're never going to catch up. I know what it's like to feel like you're behind. About every other year, we run the Little Rock Half Marathon. There's about 15 of us guys that run the Little Rock Half Marathon. I hate every second of it. I don't like it. I'm angry the entire time, and I'm cursing under my breath. Don't mistake me. I do not like running, but apparently it's good for you. Every other year, these guys, these knuckleheads, talk me into it, and I say yes. Well, what we do is we try and take somebody along with us that's new, that's never done it, because I need to see someone else in shock and awe and their knees to look like cantaloupes. That's what I need. I need them to be unexpectedly in pain. Well, we had two guys do it two years ago. Of course, it's raining. It's like freezing rain. It's ridiculous. Why are we doing this? And we get out there, and they're both actually over at our Conway campus. Luke Brown is one of our pastors, and Chad Rawls, one of our lay pastors over small groups. And these two guys got out there, and they're just furious at me, and uh, <laughs> they would just get out there and start running. Now, at mile 10, mile 10 is about where you are in the pit of despair. It's like you're running through the fire swamp in The Princess Bride, and everything is attacking you. You hate your life, and you don't want to continue. You want to just pull over on the side of the road and hit the rest stop for a while and eat something. Well, these two guys are jogging, and if you've run a marathon, you know there's this back and forth of people passing you, you passing other people, and this back and forth. Well, a particular uh, moment around the 10.5 mile mark, 
this lady passes Chad and Luke on the right-hand side. Normally, no big deal. And that's not, you know, you don't think much of it. But she's carrying something with her in her left hand that is extremely critical with this story. Can we zoom in and enhance here for a second? We've referred to this lady as smoking lady because Luke took out his phone and took a picture of it because they started laughing. This woman, now think about it, you're at mile 10. The only sound you can hear is your feet flapping on the pavement and you are questioning life itself. And a woman smoking a Marlboro runs past you and you can't get oxygen in your lungs and she's putting the exact opposite of oxygen in her lungs. She's, <laughs> ah, fellas, let's see the finish line. I'm not sure if that's what her voice was, but she's passing them smoking the opposite of air and she passed them. So these two guys look at each other like, uh, smoking lady can't beat us today, there's no way. And so they, they muscle up and barely pass her at the finish line. Good job, boys. You thought they beat the Kenyans. Like, we got the gold medal. No, you beat smoking lady. I know what it's like to be behind. It's frustrating. But listen to me. If we keep comparing ourselves to everybody else in this area, all you're going to do is stay exactly where you are. And I'm going to challenge you with this. And my promise is very simple. If you will do this with us, you're going to know God's will for your life. You're going to understand his voice. And you're finally going to understand what it's like when you read the Bible. Like, what does this actually mean? This is so important. This is how you win. So take that piece of paper out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the ABCs of quiet time. This is pretty simple. Um, what we're going to do is the ABCs, you'll notice that it's on there. The ABCs actually stand for uh, ask questions, the best verse, and then communicate. Those are simple, but we're going to look at a scripture. Uh, and here, here there is. Well, it's okay. My bad. Sorry on that one. Uh, this scripture that we're going to look at is Matthew 22. And what we're going to do is this is going to be the scripture that we look at for this quiet time. We're going to have a quiet time together. And we're going to go through this. And I'm going to ask you guys to write things down. I'm going to give you a minute to do it. But this scripture is our base scripture. I'm going to read it to you really quickly. You may have heard this. This is actually called the Great Commandment. And Jesus says this in Matthew 22. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This simple verse is what our base is going to be. Now those ABCs, we're going to go through those really quick. And A stands for ask questions. Now, it's important that you know how we need to approach God when it comes to something like this. How do we approach God? Does the Bible say anything about how we're supposed to go to God and talk to him? And it does. Matthew 18, Jesus says this. It might sound confusing when you look at it, but in Matthew 18, he gives us an example of how we have to do it. Jesus says, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Does that sound weird to anybody or is that just me? Like you read that and you're going, what in the world are we talking about here? Jesus is talking to a bunch of people who are basically professional Christians. That's what they are. They, they went pro. They have endorsement deals and contracts. They have long-term. I mean, these guys are professional know-it-alls. They've studied the Bible. They know the law. They know all of it. And they're standing there with their arms folded, and they can't hear a word that Jesus is saying because they're not asking any questions. They know everything. And he's saying, unless you come like a little child, you're never going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And it just infuriated them. Well, how does a little child approach life? Pastor Rick said it last week. The kids ask a lot of questions. And that is the way that God wants us to approach him with humility and curiosity and just innocence. Like, it's okay to ask God questions. He loves it when we ask, and especially when we go to his word. Recently, I heard a story about a kindergarten teacher that had a new class that had come in, and I don't know how kindergarten teachers don't get a Nobel Peace Prize because I don't know how you take that many kids who don't know structure or order and, and get them to line up. But she was doing really well. It was one girl in the class who just wasn't, she, she couldn't grasp these new structures and, and the system of school. She gave this whole class this assignment. She said, hey, I'm gonna give you a couple of crayons. You only get to use those colors, but I want you to draw something from your imagination. Just draw it out. She's walking up and down the rows and she's stopping at different desks and she stops at this little girl's desk and she says, sweetheart, what are you, what are you gonna draw? 
And the girl doesn't look up. She's still, you know, your tongue just sticks out of the side of your mouth and she's drawing and she's scribbling furiously on the paper. And she says, well, I'm, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher goes, oh, sweetheart, that's, that's too bad because nobody knows what he looks like. Nobody knows what God looks like. The kid does not flinch, doesn't bat an eye. She goes, oh, they will when I get done with this picture. They'll know. <laughs> I love that innocence. She's not coloring in the lines. A lot of times we do this. We read these scriptures and we see them as words, but you've got to understand God wants us to look at it and say, God, what are you saying to me here? We want to check a box and do our, our year of the Bible or whatever. I think maybe it might be better sometimes than going through all of these scriptures and just staying in the lines. Maybe we just need to do one scripture and just settle on it and just say, God, what are you saying to me? So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and ask some questions. There are five questions that we are going to ask about that scripture. We are all going to ask the same questions. They're all there. And you can do this with any scripture. But the first question I want to ask is, is there a command to obey? When you look at this scripture, is there something that is obvious to you? I want you to write it down on that right-hand side. Everybody in here, even if you've been doing quiet times forever, or this is your first time, take a pen out and write it down. Write down what you see. Is there a command to obey in there. Just take a minute. Okay. Is there, is there, I, here's what I wrote down. I don't know if you saw a command, but is there a command in here? The first one that I see, do you, you guys see this one? The, Loving the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind is the first and greatest commandment. Obviously, I wrote that one down. Is there, is there any other commands in here that are not just a suggestion, but it's a command? You see them? There's two. What I wrote is the second one, is that we're supposed to love people well. Love your neighbor as yourself. That actually means not as yourself, but love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. That's what that means. So I wrote both of those down. That's pretty obvious. Not every scripture you're going to be able to answer all five of these, but this one... You can. So I want you to look at the second question. And this is very simple, but it's an easy way to approach it. Is there a promise in that scripture for you to claim? Is there something that you see in there? You're going, wait a minute, God, there's a promise from you, and I want that in my life. And so I'm, I'm going to claim that. What is it? See if you can find it and, and write it down. Whatever God's showing you. Here's, here's what I wrote down. This is what I wrote down. You might have written something else. But I look at this as a, if you do this, then this. Here's how I see this. Is if I will love God well first, He's going to help me do this one. The promise that I see in here is that if I love God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, He's going to help me love people well. But if I try and love people well without Jesus in my life, I'm going to get really tired. It's going to be difficult to do. And that's a promise. God's saying, love me well, and then love people well. But if you do this first, I'm going to help you with this one. That's a promise. The third question, pretty simple. Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a trap? Is there a pitfall? Is there something in this scripture that God's saying, hey, watch out for this. Don't do this. See if you find one and write it down. I wrote and the sin that I see in this is how I treat people can actually be a sin sometimes my mind gets in the way and how I treat people can be wrong and what this helps me to remember is that I need to love my neighbor or love people as much as I love myself and sometimes I, I let my brain or my emotions get in the way and I have to remember that we all need forgiveness we're all broken people, and I need to love them well, and I need to be careful not to do it the wrong way, not, not to be messing people up, but I need to love them well, and that's a sin. All right, the fourth one, fourth question, pretty simple. Is there an application to make? 
Is there something in here? Because listen, if we just read that scripture and we don't do anything, just went in one ear and out the other, and that's not what scripture's for. Our faith needs to be practical, so it should be something you can do. Is there something in here that I can do right now? Go ahead and write that down over on the right-hand side. Is there anything that you can do? What I wrote is <laughs> the practical side of this is, is love your neighbor as yourself. I wrote names down. See, it's one thing to plan to love people well, and it's another thing to actually love them well. And I wrote names down of people that, so there's a couple people that I need to ask them to forgive me because I, I haven't done it right with them. And there's another person that I genuinely need to help. Like God put him on my heart a little while ago like I just can't get them out of my head and all of a sudden I realize I have never done anything about it. God will show you faces all the time. Just we need to act on it. That for me, is there an application? Yeah, there's a couple people I need to check in on and just I need to be, I need to be better at taking care of them. I need to do right by them. The last question is the one that is a lot like that kindergarten teacher's project. And this takes a little bit of imagination, but is there something new about God in that scripture? You might know this scripture. You might have read this scripture a hundred times. You know it. You memorized it. Is there anything new in here you've never seen before? Write that down. Just take a minute. What I see that is new here, uh, the first one is pretty obvious. When you look at this, it's kind of a setup as well, but the first two words are, are what? Jesus replied. You ever ask yourself, Jesus replied to what? Like, what is he replying to? That means that somebody asked him something. Something else happened up here, up here that we don't have there. What this is, this section of scripture, if you just were to go back and read the previous verse, this is cheating a little bit, but a bunch of those professional Christians, those hypocrites, those guys, they were trying to trap Jesus, and so they hired a Bible lawyer a Bible attorney to catch Jesus in a trap. And they asked him the question, what's the greatest commandment? And this is what Jesus replies to. They were trying to catch him. So Jesus replies, and my question to you is, when we read this, did Jesus say this in English? Because this is the NIV. This is the new international version, right? Did Jesus speak NIV? A lot of you think he spoke King James, and these thousand those are not true. I got you on that one. Thank you. That, that is, that's not how, and we like to think that because there's a translation that we like, but was Jesus speaking English at all? No. So what was this written in? What language was this written in? Because this is New Testament. Anybody know? Greek. The New Testament is written in Greek. Okay, all right, so if it's written in Greek, was Jesus speaking Greek when he, when, he, when he said these words? Nope. He was speaking Hebrew. It was written in Greek and translated to English. You ever try and Google translate something? I have spent mission trips where I have Google Translator in my pocket, and I am literally riding in a bus with no one that speaks English. I say something in a Google Translate. I don't know what it translated to, and I turn and hold my phone Whatever it is showing them in their language, I promise you is not what I said. We definitely got our wires crossed. All of a sudden they're like, oh, and then they hold their ears and they, they run away. We get our wires crossed sometimes because we don't understand that this was originally said in Hebrew. And if you recognize, this shows up in the Bible in other places. What Jesus is doing is he's answering them with rabbinic law, the exact law that they knew. This is something new that I never saw before. And he is quoting Deuteronomy 6 and Ezekiel 19. And here's what he's saying to him. Hey, boys, you're paying a lot of attention to these rules and you're missing out on the fact that I'm standing right in front of you. I'm right here. And I just want you to love me well. Please stop treating people like garbage. Treat them better. This is your law. This is the thing you're trying to trap me in. He used their own words right back against him. I'd never seen that before. Now, we just did something that you might have heard of but you've never really done it yourself or thought you could do it. 
yourself. And a lot of people say we need to meditate on God's word. That's actually what we just did. Nobody hit a gong. There was no goat yoga. There's no hot yoga. There's nobody, nothing weird happened. But we say meditate on God's word. What are you saying? What does that mean? Like what? We'll say you need to think about that. We'll ruminate on that. We need to marinate in that. Like why are we talking about gravy again? This is weird. All that means is that we would slow down and think about it. That's what we just did. We just meditated on God's word. Now, if the ask questions is the shotgun, it's the shotgun approach to the ABCs, then the B is the sniper rifle looking down the scope at the bullseye. And this is where you pin it on your heart and you make it personal. So the B stands for best verse. And the best verse, what I want you to do is this. Out of those scriptures that are in there, I want you to write down the one that stands out to you. Like which one stands out to you? What I want you to do is actually, I don't want you to write the scripture down. I want you to write, we already have it there. You don't need to rewrite it. I want you to write down why it stands out to you. Just take 10 seconds. Why does that scripture stand out to you? What part of it is standing out? Like why? God, why is this, why is this making sense to me? What are you trying to say to me? What I believe God is, is trying to say to me is, um, Neil, sometimes you try and do this one without this one, and I just want to be first in your life. That's why he's saying this. I know why he's saying this one to me. I've heard it time and time again. I know why this scripture right here, love your neighbor as yourself. I know why it stands out, because I'm busy. I just kind of blow right past people on my calendar sometimes. I need to slow down. That's why he's saying that to me. That's God speaking to you. The C is communicate. Communicate with God. That's just prayer. Now, what I would do before you sit down and do a quiet time, I would pray very simply, very briefly. I'm going to pray this out loud. My eyes are open. That might freak everyone out, but I just want you to know you can pray with your eyes open. Don't pray with your eyes closed while driving. Very dangerous. With your eyes open, I just, I'm, here's, a, here's how I would approach this. I would pray before I do this quiet time, and I would say, God, i got a busy day ahead of me. My calendar is full. i got appointments like crazy, and I just need time with you. And I'm asking you for help because I want to understand what this says. I need you to show up because I don't want to do the rest of today by myself. Please don't let this be confusing. In Jesus' name, amen. That's how I'd start it. How I would end it is by praying this scripture over your life. Praying scripture over your life is very powerful. Some of you may not know how to pray. You may not know the words to say. You, you might be confused, you've heard a lot of other people pray a certain way, you think you have to pray like them, and that's not necessarily true. <clears throat> if you pray scripture over your life, that's very powerful because those words are living. They're life to those that find them, they're health to all of their flesh. There's power in these words. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm going to pray this scripture really quick. I'm gonna show you exactly how I would do it. And then I want you to take 30 seconds, quietly in your seat, and I want you to pray the scripture over your life, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through this, and I'll show you exactly how this is done. Very, very simple. I would pray this. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words, because I need to remember this. Please help me to love you first. God, don't let my emotions get in the way. Don't let my heart get out of whack. But I want to love you and not overthink it. And I want to do it first because I know how important this is to you, God. This is important to you, but it, it needs to be important to me. And that's what I'm doing. I'm making this important to me today. God, please help me to love people that are easy to love and help me to love my enemies. Help me to love people that aren't easy because I know you don't just love me, but you love the people I'm working with, I go to school with. God, your word is alive and I need it. I love you. Sometimes I don't get this right. Forgive me for not getting this right. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me do this today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take 30 seconds in your own words and close your eyes. Keep your eyes open. It doesn't matter to me. Take 30 seconds. I want you to make this personal. I just want you to pray this over your life. Just take a second and do it.
Amen. Some of you guys, that felt like three hours. I haven't ever prayed that long in my entire life. That's all right. Listen, you don't have to worry about how do I start doing a quiet time because you just did one. We just did one together. This is what a quiet time is. It's unhurried time with God. Now, on average, this could look like this. Five minutes to read a scripture. It takes seven minutes to write down what you just did and three minutes to pray. That's 15 minutes. It's not much. You might not have 15 minutes. You might have 10. Then give God the best 10 minutes of your day. After you do this for a while, you're going to want more. I promise you. Because God's going to show up. He's going to meet you right where you are. So I'm going to make a bold promise for you. We don't typically do this in a lot of areas of our life because we're cynical, we're skeptical, we don't, we don't believe in the, the money-back guarantee. But I promise you, if you do this for three weeks, you're going to know the voice of God. You're going to know your purpose. The Bible is finally going to make sense to you. And you're not going to feel alone in it. I promise you. There are hundreds of guys across central Arkansas that are doing this, and their lives are very different because of it. Now, there are a couple traps that are in here. The few traps are, first of all, what you're probably thinking is, well, Neil, I've tried this before, and it didn't work, it didn't stick. I say, forget all that. Don't worry about it. If you've never done it like this, or it's never worked for you, period, start now. Every day is day one. Let today be day one. It's all right. Don't worry about it if it didn't work. It can work today. The other trap is this, and a lot of us do this, myself included. We hope and we want this to take root in our lives, but we don't actually plan on it. We don't actually put it on our calendar. And I would say that's a trap that I see a lot of people fall into. Put it on your calendar. Like, put it in your day. Plan on it. Don't just hope that it happens because it won't. Soccer practice is still coming. Put these 15 minutes in your, in your calendar. Now, I didn't see anybody pull out their phone and put it in their calendar. I'm not hurt. I'm not offended by that. It's okay. It's no big deal. We are actually going to do something for you because I understand you're, you're, you're saying, listen, this was, I think this was pretty good. I think I like this. What I promise you is that if you do this for three weeks, you're going to start a new pattern in your life, and your life's going to be changed for the better. And this is how you win. This is how you measure everything in life. But you have got to walk back out those doors. You're not going to have Brandon playing keys for you. You're going to have kids that are screaming. You're going to have a, a sink that is overflowing and a lawnmower on fire in your front yard. I get it. I've been there. Um, so we're going to meet you right where you're at. At the bottom of your paper, you'll see that there are two social media icons at the bottom of that paper, Instagram and Facebook. If you will follow NLC Live right now on your phone, every morning, starting tomorrow for the next seven weeks, we will give you a scripture that we will do together. We will give you every question to ask and every reminder that you need to give you the roadmap so we can do it together. And here's my promise. We're going to be right there with you. We'll be praying for you. We will answer any questions you have, and I will be doing it right along with you. It starts tomorrow morning. It'll hit Facebook and Instagram at 5 a.m., and it's there for you. I would challenge you to take your phone out right now and follow one of those two accounts. I don't know if you like Facebook or if you like Instagram. Do it right now. We will help you with the part that maybe you haven't learned how to do. Like, where do I go? Where do I open up in the Bible? How do I do this? We will track with you. We're doing it together with you. It's really fun when you do this with somebody, not just by yourself. Here's my last thing. I want everybody to look at me really quick. You don't even have to look at the screens. You can look at me. There they are. I want the guys especially. Men, I want you to look at me. Every guy in this place. This isn't just going to change your life. It's going to change your home. It's going to change your home, and you're going to wish you did this a lot sooner. There's a guy in Conway. His name's Joey Smith. Joey and I have been in ministry. He's been serving in men's ministry and life groups for years, as long as I've been at the church. We've been on mission trips together in Peru. We've been in the jungles of the Amazon together. He's one of the strongest business leaders and husbands and fathers that I know. And he said yes to what I just asked you to do back at the beginning of January. And four weeks in, his wife, she took a picture of Joey and his son Hayes. And if you'll notice what Hayes is doing, he has pulled out a Bible and he is going through and finding the scriptures right alongside his dad. Ladies, if 
this is what you want in your home, you don't need to be the Holy Spirit for your husband. Just pray for him. Man, look at me. This is what changes your house. This is how you win. It doesn't just change you. This changes your whole home. And God wants to do it. You're not twisting his arm with this. He wants to do it. And you could finally win. You don't have to walk out of here thinking you're behind anymore. Let me pray for you.